Thank you. Uh, thanks for that uh, introduction, Dan. Very generous. Nice to see so many people out on a warm Sydney evening to discuss a hot topic. Um, today is an exciting day in Australian book publishing. I was thrilled to read the news this morning, as I'm sure you all were, that Scott Morrison is about to publish <laughs> a memoir <laughs> about, about his faith relationship and um, he's promised us that it will be a book like no other that any Australian Prime Minister has ever written, which I don't doubt for a second. <laughs> Um, so, um, it's a double delight because now we have Sam Rogovin to, to discuss with us a book about Australian national security, unlike any other book uh, about Australian national security that's ever been written. Uh, Sam has done something very bold and very brave, and he has punched the conventional wisdom right on the nose with the Echidna strategy. My, my um, dear departed father used to say, that uh, one unconventional thinker is worth a hundred yes men. It was one of his favorite quotes. So he was always on the lookout for the unconventional thinker, the lateral thinker, the naysayer, uh, the tweaker of the conventional wisdom. Uh, so that's what, that's what uh, Sam has done for us with this book. Before I ask Sam about the book, I just want to ask you a little bit about uh, your background. As Dan mentioned, you spent, what was it, a decade at the Office of National Assessments, um, which I think is now defunct and replaced by the Office of National Intelligence. But it's, so the ONA was a, a, a super secret thing that did all the analysis of the raw intelligence and was supposed to produce top level advice to governments, to the Prime Minister. Mm. Uh, now, you're not allowed to talk about what you did there, but I want to ask you this general question, because it's always interesting looking at that world from the outside. Yeah. If Australians saw and read all the material goes on in, the, in there and sees how it works mm. and saw how it worked, would that make Australians sleep better at night or would it make us stay up biting our nails? <laughs> well, thank you, Peter. And uh, first of all, let me thank Dan for uh, the wonderful introduction and roaring stories for uh, making this evening possible. Thanks to all of you for coming here. Um, Dan mentioned the food. I can recommend the... Uh, uh, the, the um, is it the tuna salad or the, uh, yeah, it's tuna salad anyway, it's wonderful. Um, enjoy, enjoy a meal here afterwards and a drink. Um, yes, I, well, I spent almost a decade in, the, in what's known as the Australian intelligence community, actually these days known as the national intelligence community, the NIC, they actually refer to it that way. They, they're, they're, uh, they're addicted to uh, acronyms and abbreviations in Canberra, just as they are in Washington. Uh, and two of those years were in what was then known as ONA, the Office of National Assessments, is now known as the Office of National Intelligence. Look, uh, not to deflate the, uh, air, the air of sort of uh, intrigue around those organisations, but if any of you saw what went on in those buildings, first of all, you'd be underwhelmed because <laughs> it, it, it looks like any white collar Australian workplace that you've ever entered into. Um, it's, uh, it's full of uh, open plan desk areas, you know, people shuffling papers. There's a communal kitchen where people go to microwave their lunch. There are, uh, you know, school charity chocolates for sale. It's all very, very normal. The main difference is that it's very hard to get into the building. So, um, you know, you have to pass through various security checks. And also, once you're inside, there are... Uh, uh, there are um, safes uh, around the place with combination locks and there is uh, a strict adherence to what they call a clean desk policy, which is to say you do not leave classified paperwork on your desk when you leave at night. Everything has to be put away and uh, locked in a, in a combination safe. But other than that, it's a perfectly bog standard workplace. Um, would you be shocked by what you read? Would it change your mind about the world? Well. The short answer is no. Uh, so when I worked in ONA, as it was then known, uh, ONA's job at the time, I think it's changed a little since then, but really the, the core job for analysts at ONA, which is what I was, uh, um, uh, an analyst there of North Asian security issues. I worked a lot on uh, weapons of mass destruction. 
so my job was really to pull together all the different types of intelligence that we get through our Five Eyes partners and through our own efforts and to write reports about them and to tell the Prime Minister and the Cabinet uh, you know, what mattered, what they should pay attention to and what not to pay attention to. And the part of the job was to do long range assessments. So over many years, you know, what, what, what are the big changes happening in the region, for instance? And on that score, I have to say that uh, in the, the actual classified intelligence that I saw rarely made me change my mind about those long term trends. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, the judgments that I arrived at uh, would not have changed had I only had access to open sources. There were other people within the office who were working on, issue, on different issues and who were being asked to produce briefs, let's say for a cabinet minister making a foreign visit. Uh, and in that case, the classified intelligence can help change the picture, right? But the, but the shelf life of that information, of that intelligence, so for instance, you know, if we're bugging the phone of a particular foreign official, that's pretty short, that shelf life. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it can change judgments about what, you, what a minister might say in a negotiation uh, the, the following day or the following week. But in terms of the long-term trends, the things that we're all worried about, for instance, climate change or China's rise as a military power uh, and a strategic power, there's not an awful lot to be learned from the classified sources that you wouldn't be seeing in, uh, in the open sources. Uh, and so, no, I don't think it would radically change anyone's worldview in this room. Good, we can all rest easy with our <laughs> prejudices and assumptions. Um, thank you, Sam. I want to ask you a question about um, the state of play in Australia at the moment. Um, with the change of government, we saw with the passing of Morrison and the advent of Albanese. He's still alive. <laughs> oh, that's true. I, I, I'm well by the know who's written the, the memoir for him. <laughs> Supposed to be the voice of God. Um, I'm, I'm keeping an open mind, everybody. Just, <laughs> I think it's very healthy. Um, okay, with the what Scott Morrison uh, described to uh, an audience recently as his decision to resign from the prime ministership, <laughs> and Anthony Albanese's, I suppose, decision to apply for the <laughs> prime ministership successfully, we saw a change in the rhetoric where the Australian uh, uh, level of uh, bravado and chest beating about China. Mm. Uh, has essentially uh, disappeared and instead we have a much more moderate uh, tone, um, much more reasonable. Uh, the freeze on political relations has thawed. The trade bans have started to be unwound. <coughs> Does that mean that the China crisis has passed? Does that mean that the danger is behind us and we can all relax? Well, I certainly think it means the crisis has passed. Yes, I do agree with that. And uh, it, I endorse the way you describe uh, events of recent months and you know, since the election of the Albanese government. Um, it doesn't mean that the long term problem has been resolved in any way. I mean, China is going to be big for the indefinite future. Um, if, if we're all waiting for China to kind of implode, then I think we're going to be waiting a long, long time. As Adam Smith used to say, there's a lot of ruin in a nation. Um, you know, China, an awful lot can go wrong for China in the next uh, 10 or 20 or 30 years. An awful lot is going wrong right now, and it won't significantly knock China off its trajectory to becoming, you know, easily the largest economy in Asia and probably the largest economy in the world. On Australia's uh, uh, position, uh, the, the rhetoric has clearly changed, and the change of government came at the right time. It gave China an excuse to re-engage. Uh, in a way that it would have been politically much more difficult to do if the Morrison government had been returned. Um, but policy really hasn't changed in Australia. I don't think there's been any significant policy shift from this government as compared to the last one. And that I think there is an important lesson to be learned from uh, the response, the policy response that Australia has had to China's economic coercion campaign. As you say quite correctly, uh, those measures are being dialed down now. The, the barley ban was the last one to come off, or at least the, the tariffs against barley. So that, that, um, uh, that's a clear indication that the economic coercion campaign is winding down. Um, and I think that is a 
for someone who is generally a critic of both sides of politics on defence and foreign policy, I think that's a, a signal victory for Australian policy under both governments, a really important one. Uh, but also, I would say, just to kind of twist the knife a little bit, it's, it's kind of a victory from which we are refusing to learn. Hmm. So it seems to me that the, the, the notable aspect of Australia's response to the econ China's economic coercion is that no serious analyst or senior political figure at any time endorsed the idea that Australia should retaliate to China's economic coercion. The one exception was um, Senator Matt Canavan, who said we should be putting tariffs on Australian um, iron ore exports. Nobody took that seriously. Mm. And in fact, no as I said, no serious commentator proposed anything like that. It's interesting to reflect on why that is. I think to me, the simple answer to, to that question is that everyone understood implicitly that retaliation of that kind was a recipe for escalating the conflict, increasing the stakes for China, and that if we tried to do that, then uh, China would hit back even harder. When you're, in a, when you're in that kind of a political struggle with a superpower, it's in your interest to not escalate. When you escalate, you lose. And I think in terms of the economic coercion campaign, even though it may not have been articulated that way, we Australians, both governments, implicitly understood that. It seems to me that we've simply refused to learn that lesson when it comes to our defence policy. So instead of a policy that emphasises you know, all the attributes of an echidna, that is uh, uh, stoicism, resilience, um, defending yourself close to your borders, um, Australia has taken the opposite approach and under AUKUS we are proposing now to defend ourselves thousands of kilometres to our north and our strategy is going to be to hem the Chinese Navy in along its coastlines with our fleet of uh, nuclear powered submarines. Uh, it seems to me there's a, a cheaper and more sensible and less, uh, less provocative and less escalatory strategy right there for the taking. It doesn't need to be very expensive uh, or ambitious. And, and we're leaving it on the table in, in, place, uh, in place of a strategy that, you know, I think makes our security circumstances materially worse. Okay, I, I'll ask you about the Echidna strategy in more detail in a moment, but to pick up your point there, one of the tenets of your book is consistent with what you've just said, that Australia has to avoid provoking China, mm. um, and yet the experiences of the last few years was that Australia did several things which effectively did provoke China that brought on uh, political retaliation in the form we just discussed, um, that, that where Australia then also added the extra increment of announcing AUKUS mm -hmm. in the middle of all that. And yet, despite what would traditionally been, be uh, considered a provocation, and then the further provocation of announcing the AUKUS agreement, Despite all of that, the res net result is Beijing now backing off, which suggests that uh, it was, rather than the success of avoiding provocation, by standing up, if, if I could put it that way, by refusing to bow down, and in fact, taking even tougher measures, uh, Australia seemed to back China down. Does that not uh, contradict your thesis? Yeah, it's a reasonable point. I, I would only, I guess, r rebut with, the, the question of timing. It's, it's for me very difficult to see how, uh, how a, a policy announcement to acquire submarines that will arrive no sooner than 10 years into the future uh, could do very much to change China's behaviour today. Uh, so yeah, to me the timing is out. Okay, so you've got an echidna strategy for, for what you propose Australia should do. What's your metaphor? Do you have an anim animal metaphor for the current Australian strategic posture? <laughs> well, you asked me. You did ask me this before. You were, you were, you were good enough to um, give me time to prepare for this one, uh, but it didn't help because I can't think of one. <laughs> so the the problem and the reason the reason I can't think of one is because I think Australian strategic policy is somewhat incoherent right now. I guess that's not surprising that I would say that. Uh, but specifically, the reason I think it's incoherent is that uh, this government really inherited AUKUS and is trying to make the best of it uh, for reasons we can go into, but uh, it can't abandon AUKUS. But at the same time, the Defence Strategic Review, which is kind of a mini white paper that they released back in March, uh, 
seems to me is directly in tension with, uh, with AUKUS. Um, if you wanted to radically oversimplify the, the debate that Australian experts have been having about defence policy over, well, since the end of the Cold War... We journalists s- love simplif- oversimplification, Good. so please Good. go ahead. OK, get ready, get ready. So there are basically two schools, one called the Defence of Australia School, the other Forward Defence. The Defence of Australia School basically says that uh, the job of the ADF is to defend the Australian continent, and that's it. Right? That's what we design our Defence Force to do. The, def- the Forward Defence School says actually Australia, with, along uh, with its major ally, uh, should play a part in stabilising the entire region and needs to defend itself far north of its borders. So uh, some of you might remember uh, up until the early 1980s, we had an Air Force base in Malaysia, in Butterworth. Um, uh, these days we don't do that anymore. And of course, under the Hawke government, we moved very much to you know, what I call the, the Defence of Australia School. Now, the paper that the government released back in March, the, called the Defence Strategic Review, is to my mind very much in that Defence of Australia tradition. And in fact, it uses a very interesting phrase, Peter. It, it uses a phrase that has only ever been used before in describing China's strategy. It's called A2AD. And that means anti-access area denial, which is a very, um, uh, a very awkward uh, way of describing what is really a very simple strategy that China has pursued over the last 30 years, which is to build a, a naval and an air force that essentially makes it impossible for any adversary, namely the United States, to operate near China's coast. Right? So, th- th- And this is not particularly dif- uh, technologically difficult or even very expensive to do, and Australia can do it too. Right? We can build uh, missiles and, and uh, uh, submarines and uh, aircraft that can make it impossible for any adversary to operate around, you know, within a couple of, several hundred or even a thousand kilometres or more of Australia's northern approaches. Uh, And the the Defence Strategic Review endorsed that idea. And to me, that's a great idea for Australia. It's an affordable way to defend the continent. Okay. Now, now, uh, Mm. sorry, very briefly to, to finish that off, it seems to me AUKUS is directly at odds with that. You don't need these long-range submarines for, for a defence of Australia strategy. You only need them if you're going to pursue a forward defence strategy, which means, you know, in coalition with the United States, operating thousands of kilometres to Australia's north, probably along China's coastline. OK, so in the absence of an, a, an alternative animal metaphor, but you say the current situation is in, policy is incoherent and maybe uh, changeable, so I'm going to call it a chameleon Mm. Just for just for our purposes tonight. So, you, sh- you think we should we should kill the chameleon and we should bring the echidna to the table? Uh, on your on your last point um, about defence of our near approaches versus further afield, um, Anthony Albanese, there is no security in isolation. Unquote. Um, isn't that right? I mean, what's the point of defending our territorial integrity if all of our trade, all of our domestic uh, supply needs, everything from fuel to pharmaceuticals, our ability to earn a living in the world through exports, if all of that is indeed dependent on uh, shipping lanes which extend thousands of kilometres from our continent, mm. how can we defend those if we have a capability that only extends a few hundred kilometres offshore? Uh, I mean, I, I, I certainly endorse the idea that there is no security in isolation, and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing I hope in the book that would uh, lead a reader to assume that I feel that way. I mean, I'm calling for a new kind of internationalism for Australia, a foreign policy that's very much directed at uh, at our at our neighbours, uh, but also, as as you heard at the beginning, in in bringing the great powers together to settle their disputes peacefully. Um, but that doesn't mean that your defence policy needs to be that ambitious. I want Australia to be a very ambitious country, but defence policy is the wrong thing to be ambitious about. So I'd rather flip it the other way and have uh, a slightly more modest defence policy and that that serves a foreign policy which is incredibly ambitious and internationalist. Uh, so I, I, I really, the, the difference here is on, is on a point of emphasis. Um, I, I think Australia is now uh, proposing a defence policy which is, well, I, I think the phrase I use in the book is vaultingly ambitious, uh, to the point where in practical terms, 
uh, like many people, there are, there are many AUKUS supporters in Australia who in their quieter moments, in their private moments, say that, you know, this is a good idea in theory, but in practice, we are never going to get this done. It is so incredibly complex. Uh, and so if we're betting all our chips on this, that, that seems to me a, uh, uh, a, not only a, a dangerous strategy and possibly provocative to China, but dangerous also in terms of that, that we're, we're throwing a whole lot of uh, effort into one single project that you know, has the potential to consume the entire defence budget. Okay, so um, what else is wrong? What else are we doing? What's the current, what are the current, current elements of strategy that are wrong and why? What are the, the principal ones? Well, I start with the United States. So uh, I, I'm by no means anti-American uh, and uh, am by no means advocating the end of the alliance. I think actually, as I say in the book, it's likely that the alliance will leave us before we ever leave the alliance. But I think, the, I start with the United States because I think we are betting too much on the proposition that the United States has a uh, a core security interest in this region. Uh, our entire defence policy, in fact, you know, a large part of our foreign policy too, is premised on the idea that the United that for the United States, Asian security is just as important as security of the homeland, for instance. That America cannot be secure unless Asia is secure. And so, the question I ask at the beginning of the book is: Is that true? And actually, I don't think it is. When you examine it closely, America is an incredibly secure country. Uh, even with uh, facing an adversary of the scale of China, the largest adversary that America has ever faced in its you know, century or more of being a great power, it has never faced a challenge as big as China, certainly bigger than the Soviet Union. Um, but even despite that, the United States is incredibly secure. It is separated from China by a vast ocean. Uh, it ha the United States has a massive economy with all sorts of uh, you know, advantages and attributes that will make it an incredibly successful and vibrant economy for the foreseeable future. Uh, it has the largest military in the world with a huge budget. It has thousands of nuclear weapons. It is surrounded by uh, friendly powers to the north and south. So what is it exactly that China could do to the United States that make it vital for America to be in Asia and to be the most, uh, to be the senior and the dominant military power in this region. I, I don't think there is a good enough reason. And if you're taking on a project as big as China, you need a really good reason. You need an existential reason, like was the case during the Cold War. But there is no existential reason. And so for that reason, uh, allies such as Australia, but also Japan and Korea have to ask themselves, well, would the United States really be prepared to make major sacrifices on our behalf? And I think, you know, when, when the rubber hits the road, if there's ever a security dispute where the United States is a threat of, or at risk of potentially launching World War III against China, then the Americans will sober up and say to themselves, actually, is this really important enough? Would we really do this? And to me, the, the obvious answer is to say, no, our interests are not so deeply in, uh, at threat in Asia that we need to take that kind of risk. Well, let me quote to you, um, and I think you also mentioned him in the book, Elbridge Colby, who was the lead author of the US National Security Strategy of 2018. So that was, the, that was under the Trump administration. Uh, Elbridge Colby uh, is, in, in the American spectrum, hawkish on China, um, and yet he's within the spectrum of American security analysis, I think he's still fits in the mainstream, um, but on the, on, the, on the Trumpy and hawkish end. Mm. Now, th mind you, this is an, an administration whose policy was America first, and yet Elbridge Colby has said that um, with Asia comprising most of the world economy, any power that can uh, marshal and coerce and muster the power of the Asian economy <laughs> has the power to coerce the, the US threaten its interests and values in the long term. Therefore, the US must uh, prevent Chinese hegemony over Asia to prevent Chinese hegemony over the US and the entire planet. Mm. Now, you say in the book that, I think you say, um, Australia is holier 
um, trying to be holier than the Pope in telling the Americans what they should be thinking or doing. But in this, you dictating to the Americans what, they, what their security interests are going to be in the long term. Aren't you guilty of being holier than the Pope and telling America what its security interests are? Um, uh, I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, for, for I, people, um, I think I just did that with the wrong hand. For people listening on the podcast, for the record, uh, Sam Rogovin just blessed himself um, with his left hand. Um, uh, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> uh, it, it's about uh, Elbridge Colby. Holier than the Pope, telling the Americans what their security interests are. Yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately, they're, they're not going to be persuaded by me. You know, they, they're going to get... Uh, if, if, the, um, if push comes to shove in this region in the way I described in my earlier answer, then the Americans will decide for themselves. They'll have a very sobering moment uh, where they say, well, is this actually important enough for us? But the, the, the other thing I'd say here is that implicitly the Americans are already making this decision. So over the last 30 years in the form of China, we've seen not only the rise of a great economic power, but the most dramatic military modernization of any country in the world since the Second World War. I mean, I've been following this for most of my career, both in the intelligence world and now in the think tank world, I've been watching China's development as a military power. It is truly impressive and truly dramatic. Uh, you would think that if the United States had actually decided deep down in its bones that this cannot be, that, that, uh, that China can never be the most important uh, military and strategic power in the region, that by this point, the Americans would have responded. And on the margins, they kind of have. And recently, there's been a lot of activity, well, the moving uh, forces to Australia, for instance. There are bases opening in the Philippines. Uh, Guam is uh, being re uh, uh, developed so that it can host more US troops and other forces. But I would argue that's more about shifting the pieces on the chessboard. They're not adding a lot more military capability to the region. In fact, in 30 years since the end of the Cold War, 30 odd years, American force structure in Asia has barely changed. And given the scale, the sheer scale of China's rise as a military power, then it seems to me much more dramatic gestures were called for. So we're probably at the point, we, we, we're, we're at the point a decade ago, pro probably more, where the United States could have said to, uh, said to the world, you know what, Europe can take care of itself. We're moving our forces out of NATO and moving into Asia. Nothing like that has remotely happened. No, nothing of that scale has is even being contemplated. So, you, sure, listen to what the Americans say about how important Asia is to them and how important the Asian economy is to America, but also watch what they do. And this is the big missing piece. A lot of rhetoric, uh, some economic measures as well. The CHIPS Act is very significant, but uh, no major military commitments to speak of. Mm, okay. So, if the Americans are fading out, um, people vaguely familiar with your book will assume that you're thinking maybe that the China threat is overcooked and we don't have to worry so much about China. But that's not your view, is it? What, what is the main threat? Why should we worry about China? Well, China already has more military capability that it can project against Australia than the Soviet Union ever had. So that in itself is significant. Uh, and of course, China is a regional power. The Soviet Union was not really ever an Asia Pacific power. The Americans were always uh, much more uh, powerful and prominent in Asia, particularly maritime Asia, than the Soviet Union ever was. So clearly we're in a much more difficult spot than we ever were during the Cold War. So that's significant. And nor do I um, take lightly you know, China's ambitions in this region. I think we should take very seriously uh, the kind of uh, stories we all read and hear about China's uh, ambitions to, for instance, uh, build military bases in Southeast Asia. There's now strong indications of uh, a naval facility opening in, uh, in uh, Cambodia very soon. Uh, the reports that we read a few years ago about China, Chinese officials approaching Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea about a military presence in those two countries. My understanding is that those were credible reports. So China does have these ambitions and we should take that very seriously.
Uh, however, here comes the however, the caveat. Australia is protected by distance. This, in fact, the single biggest defence asset Australia has is distance. Uh, Beijing's closer to Berlin than it is to Sydney, and we often forget that. And in fact, uh, um, you know, uh, the former senator, now deceased, Jim Molan, a couple of years ago, wrote a book about the Chinese military called Danger on Our Doorstep. Well, that's a bloody big doorstep. You know, they're, they're thousands of kilometres away. And despite everything China has achieved in its military modernisation, what China has never done, what no country has ever managed to do, is overcome the, the, the iron laws of physics and engineering. And those laws basically tell you that the, the further away you want to project military force, the harder and the more expensive it gets. Right? So putting 500 kilograms of high explosive onto a target over the next hill, you can use an artillery piece. If you want to fire at 500 kilometres away, you need a combat aircraft with an airfield and all the support crews that go along with it. If it's 5,000 kilometres away, you need an intercontinental ballistic missile. You need a whole rocket industry to do that. So that, that's a massive enterprise. So at every point along that journey, uh, there's an exponential rise in cost and in difficulty of putting that warhead on that target. And yet the military effect you achieve remains constant. It's still 500 kilograms of high explosive. So therefore, distance protects us a great deal. So it's true that you know, China has missiles that can reach Northern Australia, but for one missile to hit Northern Australia would cost the Chinese military tens of millions of dollars. And you don't do that lightly. And you don't have many of those kinds of missiles to do that. Distance protects us. And that's why I say it seems to me folly on Australia's part to effectively try to compress that distance by developing long range weapons of our own when instead we could be exploiting that distance. In the unlikely event that China ever wants to use force against Australia, let them traverse that distance. Let them come to us. Well, uh, from the tyranny of distance, we now have the security of distance. Um, but, and I want to pursue that, but before I do, just to mention to the audience, in 10 minutes or so, um, we'll have questions from the audience. So be thinking if you'd like to ask Sam a question and uh, we'll come to you shortly. Um, we have a precedent, though, for an aggressor who figured out how to collapse the uh, tyranny, or I should say the security of our security of distance, um, and the geography hasn't changed, and that, of course, is Japan mm. in World War II. Um, Japan came to the same conclusion that you come to in the book, that it's prohibitive uh, for a foreign aggressor far away to invade. Um, the smart thing to do is to create bases near Australia, mm. in Japan's case, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, uh, to cut off the Australian lifelines to the world, to complicate Australian, not only su uh, uh, resupply of Australia, but also to prevent the US using Australia as a forward base to fight back against the Japanese advances in Asia. Um, why would um, why would the Chinese not replicate that strategy? I mean, you've just made the point that maybe they've got that on their minds. They're mm. already pursuing potential military bases in the Pacific Islands. Right. Um, and if so, who's going to defend our shipping lanes? Yeah, so, well, one uh, slightly glib answer to that question is that China would have to invade all of Southeast Asia first in order to replicate the Japanese strategy, which is not going to happen. But of course, to be slightly less glib about it, uh, you, you don't need to invade all these places in order to establish bases in them. You can, of course, use your economic heft to you know, create diplomatic changes in all those places that make them more amenable. Mm -hmm. And I don't, uh, I, I don't in any way want to minimise that, uh, that danger. Uh, geography hasn't changed, but technology has. And technology, military technology has changed in one important respect when it comes to uh, Australia's strategic geography. And we live in a maritime uh, region, which is to say that any military threat to Australia is going to be of a maritime nature. That's to either come over the ocean or uh, on the ocean, underneath it, or in the air over the oceans. Um, and the problem with that technologically is that since World War II, it has become infinitely easier to find and destroy targets at sea than it used to be. This was demonstrated again uh, in, in the Ukraine war just last week when the Ukrainian military uh, 
which, and by the way, Ukraine has no navy right now, was able to inflict massive losses on Russia by sinking one of its submarines and one of its landing ships, uh, which were in, anchored in port in, uh, in Crimea at Sevastopol, the major naval base there. Uh, and of course, last year, uh, Ukraine, again, has no navy of its own to speak of, sank the Moskva, which is a Russian, one of Russia's major fleet units, a cruiser of around, uh, I think, over 20,000 tonnes. So uh, it's not even close at the moment. The naval war is being won by Ukraine, and it doesn't have a navy. Um, so the, the, the evidence, actually, of the last sort of 30 or 40 years since the uh, Falklands War is that it is, in, it is incredibly cheap and effective to, uh, uh, and, e and, and relatively easy technologically to sink ships at sea. It is very difficult to protect ships at sea from modern sea skimming missiles and from submarines and torpedoes. So yeah, like I say, the, the geography hasn't changed, but the, the technology has. So that, that's to Australia's advantage, it would make it much more difficult to do for uh, China to do anything that the Japanese tried to do and, and uh, you know, threaten Australia. Uh, nevertheless, I, I don't at all dismiss the, um, the risk of Chinese basing in our region. And I think that the, the recommendation that I make in the book is that to prevent that kind of a future, uh, Australia needs a much more ambitious and vigorous foreign policy. That's not a job for defence, it's a job for foreign policy. So Dan mentioned that at the outset, the mm. three elements. Tell yeah. us your three elements and yeah. how you would implement them. Well, so if, consistent with my argument that, a, that distance is Australia's single biggest defence as, uh, uh, asset, the job for Australia is to protect that distance. And we do that via our statecraft. First of all, we do it in the Pacific Islands region by remaining the partner of choice for our Pacific Islands neighbours so that they never defect to China or even the, so that they stop bargaining with China. That, that um, uh, over the long term, I think I would like to see Australia develop some kind of Pacific Union, roughly akin to the EU, uh, with, uh, with our Pacific Island neighbours. But even short, well short of that, it, this is an ambition that I think is, is quite achievable for Australia. We can't stop the Pacific Island states uh, you know, bargaining with China and effect, uh, occasionally using China as kind of a, uh, a stick to beat Australia with and New Zealand with, as they, as they often do, that's going to happen. But we have so many inherent advantages. Pacific Islands region is much closer for us than it is for China, will always be first on the scene. Uh, we have sporting, cultural, economic ties with the Pacific Islands that the Chinese can never match. Uh, we have the Pacific Island Worker Scheme. We're a member of the Pacific Islands Forum, and China is not. And then lastly, there's an imbalance of resolve. The Pacific Islands just means more to us, to us than it does to China. So I think we have significant advantages there, and we've made a lot of progress over the last few years, starting under the, uh, the Turnbull government. Uh, and then the second part, really, is Indonesia. We, 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 I think the, the recommendation I make in the book is that we pursue a much more ambitious uh, intimate strategic partnership with Indonesia, something akin to an alliance. We'll never call it that because Indonesians don't like alliances, but I think it ought to be uh, something like that. And I think the reason why this is achievable is that we, we share one core strategic ambition with Indonesia. And that is that both countries, I think, are equally committed to the idea that we, although we cannot prevent China becoming a leading power in maritime Southeast Asia, we have it within our power to make sure that China never dominates. Right? We do not want China to ever dominate maritime Southeast Asia. Uh, that is, you know, the, the, the Indonesians take a different approach to China than we do, but I think it, uh, I sincerely hope and I, and I believe that uh, in the near future, uh, in Indonesia is going to have to take a more decisive stance and uh, its interests are going to butt up much more uh, closely against those of China. And at that point, Australia needs to be ready. So devil's advocate here, uh, that's based on a hope that Indonesia will fundamentally change its stance and its policy. In the meantime, you've dumped AUKUS. We've got the aging Collins class submarines of which <coughs> at most two can be deployed at any one time. How do we prevent China developing maritime dominance in the meantime? Well, it's not a question, just to take the submarine part first, it's not important for Australia to have submarines. What's important is for Australia to have the capability to do things that submarines can do. And what are submarines good at? They're good at sinking other ships, right? Sinking ships and other submarines. 
But that's not the only way you can do that. Right? So even if our submarine capability is not quite at the level that you might hope it is, I think actually we're in a reasonable position at the moment. The Collins class has matured belatedly, but very nicely. Um, so even if you think our submarine capability is inadequate, we can compensate via other means. And as I was saying earlier, I think the, the, uh, the formula here is, a, is an Australian version of what the Chinese called A2 AD, which is a force that is dedicated to uh, basically making it impossible for any adversary to operate ships in our near abroad. Uh, and there are, there are lots of, I think, eminently affordable ways to do that. I mean, missiles can be fired from converted passenger planes, you know. It doesn't even need particularly expensive launch platforms. So, yeah, th there's an awful lot we can do. Okay, and I cut you off uh, on before you got to the third element uh, of your proposal. Yeah, so the third element is uh, what, what is something akin to a concert of powers. Some of you may be familiar with that idea if you studied 19th century European mm -hmm. history, uh, where the major powers of the day came together to basically, basically as a conservative... Uh, group, small c conservative, in the sense that their their uh, their aim as a uh, as a grouping of major powers was essentially to prevent major change on the continent, prevent revolutionary change. It was in part a reaction to uh, uh, to Napoleonic France, um, prevent revolutionary change, but also prevent major to prevent war between the major powers. And I'm arguing in the book that we need a version of that in Asia. We need the major powers to come together to have a regular gathering every year at least and uh, as a way of settling, managing their disputes peacefully. It would have no more ambition than that. Uh, it, it is purely and simply a way for uh, Asia's major powers to come together. And Australia wouldn't be part of that grouping. So I'm asking a lot. I'm asking Australian diplomacy to be geared towards an ambition that effectively would exclude Australia. But we're not a major power, uh, and so what I want is, um, you know, the, the biggest danger to Australian security is, it seems to me, war between the US and China. And above all, that is the thing that I think a, a new Asian order uh, should be geared towards. Uh, and so quite a, apart from actually encouraging such an order to come about, uh, the other ambition that I would have for Australia is that we want to make sure that Indonesia is part of it. Uh, Indonesia, uh, you know, again, I'm... I'm I'm rehearsing the argument that I made earlier, but Indonesia is a nascent great power, mm. the only candidate to be a real great power in Southeast Asia, and uh, we want to be in their, on their good side. Uh, we, we've never had a great power on our doorstep before, and we want to make sure that when they are a great power, when they're much bigger than Australia, uh, that we're on Team Indonesia. With that, we come to audience questions. So who wants to be as bold and brave as Sam himself? And ask the first question. By the way, I, th I, I thank you for that, Peter, but um, one of the nice things about working in a think tank like the Lowy Institute and living in a country that we all live in is that what I've done doesn't require a great deal of bravery. I mean, I'm not, I'm not risking an awful lot. This is not false modesty on my part. I'm paying tribute to you know, my colleagues and also to the country that I live in that it does allow for this kind of debate. And you know, professionally, so far, I have to say that the reaction's been excellent, and if anything, I'm, you know, my status has risen because of this book. I'm not taking an awful lot of risks, but thank you. Well, that's, that, that's good to hear, and it's reassuring that we still have free speech, and you can challenge the conventional wisdom. But um, I saw your, even your boss, Michael Fullilove, saying he completely disagrees with your thesis, so <laughs> it does require some level of pluck. <laughs> and there's a brave man at the back, yes. This is because of the Chinese bans. Because 
all wine in Australia down and has just buggered these people. Okay, so I'm, I've got to repeat the question for the uh, online audience. So yeah. I'll, I'll try and tell me if I get it, get it wrong. Yeah. Um, so, Sam, the question is, at what point does Australia stop being politely obsequious uh, with China's conduct, particularly in the face of damaging trade bans, such as the one that's damaged the, the, yeah. the, the vineyards that uh, questioner has asked about? Yeah, look, uh, my, my short answer, and I, I doubt it will satisfy you, but I think a big part of the answer has to be that you only do that if, you, if you're confident you're not going to lose. Um, so, you know, it, it is to some degree simply Australia's lot in a world in which uh, we are a middle power, China is a great power, and America is a diminishing, slowly diminishing asset to Australia. In that world, uh, we, we don't get to make the rules as much as we would like. And that does mean that you know, China has a very different attitude to setting those rules. And we're not going to always like, in fact, we're frequently going to dislike the way the rules that China sets for itself. Um, that's an unfortunate reality of the modern world. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in a century now where Asia is going to be run by Asians. It's not going to be run by white people. Um, and that's not always going to suit our interests. So my short answer, and, and this applies whether to the economic sphere or the military sphere as well, uh, we fight when we think we can win. Um, another example, sort of military example that I mentioned in the book is, is the, uh, the incident that happened, I think, last year in the South China Sea where we had a, a Chinese fighter aircraft um, you know, firing uh, flares. There was an Australian patrol aircraft in the South China Sea. Uh, a Chinese fighter aircraft came, uh, flew in front of it, fired flares uh, in a way to demonstrate that, you know, the Australian aircraft was not welcome. Uh, it was a very dangerous thing to do, highly irresponsible by the Chinese. But what were we to do? What were we to do? We, we, we protested, we publicised the incident, but did we think by, that we could escalate the situation? Did we think that the principle that we were, uh, uh, that we were showing, the principle of free navigation through the South China Sea, was it that important that we could afford to escalate uh, uh, you know, a crisis into a crisis with China? Well, evidently we didn't, because we didn't think we could win. Uh, I think that was the occasion where um, the Chinese also threw some small aluminium bits of chaff yeah. into the... Yeah, chaff. Oh, I said flares, but chaff, you're right. Yeah. yeah, which could actually have brought down the, yeah. the, the RAF. If plane. they'd been ingested in the engines, they would have brought down the aircraft. Yeah. And there was at least one other incident in that same phase when the Chinese intimidation was running hot, when... Um, they were aiming lasers into the eyes of an Australian air crew? Yeah, that happened off Papua New Guinea, I believe. Yeah, right. A Chinese destroyer pointed a laser. So the lasers are on, on board these destroyers as sort of targeting devices, but they can be used also as a kind of low-level warning to, uh, to a, a patrol aircraft or another aircraft. So yeah. we'd have to assume that if there were another phase where China decided to impose some intimidation on Australia, similar things would start happening on our periphery against mm. our, our defence forces. Is there, is there a response or does Australia just have to cop it and back off? Yeah, I think Australia has to cop it. Well, we back off if it's not, if it doesn't affect our core interests. But again, I think what the, the economic coercion campaign demonstrates is that that doesn't mean you have to back down on your core interests. So at, at no point during the economic coercion campaign did Australia ever buckle to Chinese policy demands. You know, we, 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 we stood pat. And in fact, as you argued, we, we, we actually uh, pursued policies that made life even harder for China and that were directed at China. So you, you, the, the response probably won't come directly uh, against you know the asset that's making the uh, that's making the threat. It may not come against you know the destroyer or the Chinese fighter aircraft, but it doesn't have to. It can come in other realms. And and really, what I'm calling for is uh, uh, is for Australia to adopt a sort of stoicism about this, to say that to, to become implacable, to say, okay, you can intimidate us if you want to, and you can take these kind of measures, but we're not for moving. Next question, please. Uh, lady, the front here. Um, Sam, I was just wondering, with your uh, argument about you know, defending Australia and also with your argument there about if we can win, where does the line 
where is the line drawn for privileged and well-developed countries having a responsibility to helping other countries like for Taiwan or for Ukraine? Okay, I just have to repeat the question for our online audiences. Um, the question is, at what point do uh, developed countries need to assist uh, lesser countries, the example you give is Taiwan or Ukraine, in resisting coercion by larger countries? Well, again, I, I'm, I'm pretty rigidly realist on this point, and, and by realist I mean in, the, in terms of um, the, the, the foreign policy tradition which says that uh, our policy should be guided by our interests and that uh, our, uh, well, the phrase that's used these days is values should not outweigh those interests. Um, so should Australia be prepared to make certain sacrifices for the defence of uh, other democracies such as uh, Ukraine and uh, Taiwan, for instance? Yes, some, but should we be prepared to uh, fight a war that could potentially escalate into World War III? Then no, my answer is no. Um, uh, I mean, slightly provocative way to put it, but look, first of all, it, it, we, we would very much prefer, and I would personally very much prefer that Taiwan never was never under the boot of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and the fact that Taiwan is now a thriving democracy is a kind of standing rebuke to the Chinese Communist Party because it, it, it says to them, actually, your claim that China can't be democratic is wrong because look at this, look at this island just across the Taiwan Strait, absolutely thriving. So why, why can't your people have that as well? So, you know, for, if for no other reason, Taiwanese democracy is a wonderful thing in that regard. Um, but is it a vital security interest for Australia? Well, and here comes the provocation. Um, Hong Kong used to be a thriving democracy as well. It no longer is. Are Australia's interests materially affected by the fact that Hong Kong is no longer a democracy? No, not really. Uh, there were some more questions at the back. Yes. But Okay, the question was uh, about the cyber threat and how much that plays into. I couldn't quite catch the last bit, sorry. Sorry, it plays into um, the overall strategy of how we protect. And how that plays into Australia's overall defence and security strategy. Yeah, thank you. Sam. So, I, I, I talked earlier about the advantage of distance for Australia and how that affects all, the, the, all kinds of military operations. The further away you are, the harder it is to project force, military force against you. There is an exception to that rule, and it's cyber. Right? It, it, mm -hmm. It's no more difficult or expensive to launch a cyber attack against someone on the other side of the world than it is the next, your next door neighbor. Right? Yeah. Uh, geography is irrelevant when it comes to cyber. Uh, so that's an important caveat. Uh, on the other hand, the point uh, I, I would also say that so far, the evidence suggests that cyber operations in isolation are not decisive in military operations. And the strongest evidence we have is the Ukraine war, where Russia went into that campaign with you know, much vaunted uh, cyber capabilities and deployed them, deployed them very aggressively in the early stages of, uh, of the invasion. And it hasn't really worked. Uh, and so one of the things that we feared most and that Ukrainians feared most was that their electricity grid would be taken down by uh, Russian cyber activities. In the end, what the Russians decided to do, or having failed to do that, um, is to use old-fashioned high explosives to bring down uh, the Ukrainian electricity grid. And by the way, that failed too. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not so much excuse me, not so much a, a, a skeptic about uh, cyber capabilities, but simply. Uh, uh, I simply think that although it will be an important element of, um, uh, of military operations in the future, it won't be individually uh, de uh, decisive. Warfare is ultimately the application of violence to, uh, to force a country to take policy steps that it would rather not take. So you have to apply, the application of violence is central to that, right? You have to make your enemy suffer, otherwise they're not going to change their mind about the thing you want them to change their mind about. 
Um, and so far, it doesn't look as if cyber capabilities can achieve that, that level of violence uh, that, uh, that would make it decisive. Well, we're going to finish bang on time. I don't know um, whether you've changed any minds tonight, Sam, but you haven't used any violence. So congratulations. <laughs> I'm only Thanks rhetorical. For event, everybody. <laughs> Sam's got a postscript. I, I've got, I know there are books. Uh, for sale outside, and I just wanted to briefly, just to end on a light note, because I know I just talked about violence. Uh, okay, <laughs> a, a colleague of mine at the Lowy Institute, I'll just uh, tell a story that a great, uh, uh, a great dad story. So a colleague of mine at the Lowy Institute bought the book a couple of weeks ago for his dad for Father's Day. And his dad pulled one of the all time great dad moves, right? So he took this book home to his father, who unwrapped it and took a look at it. And my colleague says, Dad, one of my colleagues at the Lowy Institute wrote that book. And his father says, do you mean to tell me that your colleague gave you this book for free and now you're passing it off as my father's name? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said, no, no, Dad, I, I went to the bookshop and I bought a copy especially. And his father says, do you mean to tell me your colleague uh, wrote a book and you couldn't even get one for free? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should enlist him as an Australian negotiator. <laughs> Dear the audience, thank you for your wonderful questions. Can I please ask you all to give another round of applause?